No, no, he said already, yeah. Okay, so, Uber, first of all, you make me work very hard three years to arrive here to present this work. So each time I was finished, I know, wait, there is another one more here. So I wait, I wait, but now is the time, okay? And then uh, you are really the person to enjoy it because uh, you are, uh, you say, scientist is the one who knows how to get a solution out of enigma. As a matter of fact, this quote is not from Uber. It's from uh, Karl Kraus. But the two people are so cynically equal that I cannot distinguish one quote from another. So you can take the book of Karl Kraus, can be Uber Saler, word by word. So is the word is dedicated to you, my friend. So what I'm going, what is the enigma of the day? So the enigma is the following. Imagine that in uh, 1859, you had the chance to meet Riemann along the street of Göttingen. And he would say, look, I found a remarkable function seems to have all the zeros on the line one half. Say, so, wow, it's a, it's a puzzle, how come? And then, immediately after, you might come across the Richelieu, that was also in Göttingen. Say, so, well, I found another function that is exactly the Riemann, the zeros on the, on the same as the Riemann found on the axis one half. They say, I found another one, another one, another one, actually infinitely many functions as the zeros on the line one half. Now, as a physicist, you start suspect that there should be some basic, simple, a universal reason why all these infinite functions should have the zeros exactly on the line one half. Well, I want to convince you that the reason is very simple. It's something which are very familiar with, which is the Brownian motion, whose displacement grows like square root of n, one half. The critical exponent of a random walk is precisely one half. You cannot move around. Say differently, the central limit theorem is a stunning robust result of probability. And I want to show, indeed, that the reason uh, why all these infinitely many functions as the zeros on this line is due to an underlying Brownian motion which are behind these functions. Now keep in mind that nothing prevents a deterministic function to behave randomly. As a matter of fact, all the random generators of the world are obtained by deterministic functions. Now there is, uh, in the Riemann hypothesis, the famous epsilon, which uh, you have to mean like logarithmic correction to the power law. Actually, this uh, you will see is very welcome within uh, the uh, central limit theory and uh, the probability approach I'm going to use it. So this is based on uh, uh, several papers I wrote with André Leclerc, my close friend and collaborators. And in particular, what I'm going to present today refer to this uh, uh, last work. So the topic of the seminar, I will spend some time uh, arguing about the tension which exists between randomness and determinism. Then I will present you in a shortly the Riemann hypothesis. Then uh, I have to open widely the uh, perspective and the view and go into the Richelieu character, L function, all that, because these give us the perspective on the problem. And uh, then I will uh, uh, I will discuss the generalized Riemann hypothesis, out of which Riemann is just a simple example, but the simplest example. And then finally, I'm telling you for whom the bell tolls. Now, randomness versus determinism. Now, the first things to do in uh, uh, working on this subject is uh, undermine your psychology. What I mean is, uh, Many of us think that number theory is a really military subject whose rules uh, are deterministic and you cannot do much about it, okay? Well, is it really so? Well, I want, uh, as I say, to undermine this certainty, first of all of me and then of you. Now, let me uh, provide a significant example. There are many examples and actually 
One of the best books in this per perspective is the book by Mark Katz. It's called Probability in Number Theory, which is really a gem on the subject. So I'm going to tell you some arithmetic tales coming from the world of pi. Namely, I'm going to give you law and disorder of pi. So pi is one of the most uh, uh, ordered number in mathematics in the sense that there's uh, innumerable beautiful formula of strict determinism. So if I show you here, you are immediately tell me what will be the next term of this, as well as the Wallis formula. So you take, you know immediately what will be the next one, or even uh, extremely fast convergent in terms of Fibonacci numbers, and so on and so forth. So you say pi is really a piece of cake. It's the most ordered and elegant number we can have of. However, imagine you take the decimal representation of the number. You can do it in any base, of course, but just for remaining on a familiar ground. And then imagine you start doing statistics on each digit. You, fi you find out very easily that each digit is equally distributed in these numbers. Now, you say, well, OK, what about if I start uh, probing the number in period, say, of six? So I pick each six digit and uh, start looking how they are distributed. So you do this uh, exercise, once again, equally distributed. You take uh, other period, in particular random period. You once again pass through all these digits. You collect the result. I take randomly, I take the third digit, the 10th, the 21, the 31, up to me. Or if you want, you can take any period you like. I just pick the digit, select by this sieve, OK? Now, the point is, once again, uniform distribution. This says the number has no correlations, essentially. OK? Now, at this point, imagine the, so the displacement of all digits, of course, is 4.5, because it's the, it's the mean of 10. Well, actually, it's 0, 0, 9. So then, imagine I define a displacement function, which is the digit i minus the average. How this function distributed? Well, it's enough very, very few sampling to convince yourself that this is a Gaussian, OK? Now, as I said, this number, therefore, displays on one side completely ordered. But if you look differently, it's completely disordered, the most uh, disorder you can think of. OK, keep in mind this kind of way of thinking, because this is uh, essential to the point. Now, let me talk now about Dr. Riemann and his function. So Riemann got interest, as you probably know, in 1859 because he was elected member of the Berlin Academy of Science. And then he has to present a manuscript about this election that he has to read in front of the. And he wrote the only paper devoted to number theory that concerned the problem that Gauss was interested in, Legendre was interested in, and many other people which is uh, how many primes you have uh, up to a certain number x. So Gauss has determined this function to be logarithmic integral of x, but then I say, can I do something better on this? And indeed, he used the work of Euler, which I'm presenting shortly, to elaborate further on this. Yeah, this is the famous Euler, uh, Euler uh, identity, which shows that there is a deep relation between the integers, if you want, on the uh, left-hand side, and the prime, which is there. Now, the origin of this identity is absolutely simple, because if I expand the binomial, I get all power of the inverse of the prime. And then, when I start collecting them term by term, I will get an integers. And uh, there is a theorem of arithmetic that there is for uh, any integer is one and only one prime decomposition. So left and right, you have exactly the same, the same things. Now imagine you have, uh, from a physical point of view, a free bosonic system with this dispersion relation. Now thing, uh, uh, being a bosonic system, 
you can populate the level as much as you like. So you see, from this point of view, the, uh, right, the left hand side is like the grand canonical ensemble of this, of this system. On the other end, the right hand side is a micro canonical ensemble. So physics wise, this Euler identity is just the equivalence of ensemble, nothing else. Now, Riemann worked out the functional equation for this function because obviously this function is going to converge for real part of s larger than 1. But getting this, he was able to relate it the, the point uh, which are uh, uh, before 1. Now, I'm enlightening this uh, term which comes from the functional equation because when you go and ask what are the kind of singularity on the complex plane this function has, well, there is the polling one, as we know. Then there are these uh, zeros, which I call certain. Why certain? Because they're just the zero of the sinus of the gamma function that was shown there. And then Riemann says there are a certain uh, number of zeros, as a matter of fact, infinite, which, in my opinion, I say, are along this line. Now, people have speculated a lot how the hell Riemann uh, worked out this. And you know that years later, Siegel, uh, looking at the notes of Riemann, find out what is now known the Riemann-Siegel formula, which allow you to compute these zeros. So the idea is that Riemann used this formula, worked it out by him, to really compute the first of them and notice that they were a line on the line and say, well, I think they are all a line on this line, this is how the Riemann conjecture come about. Now, notice uh, that the duality of this function imply that if you have a zeros out of the axis above, the other should be of the axis there. On the other end, is one half, the other is symmetric around, around it. Now, this, uh, this property is crucial for my later argument, so keep in mind that this, this kind of duality which is there. Now, you might say, but how Riemann knew that there are infinite number of zeros? Well, the calculation is not easy, but he did it. After all, he invent complex analysis with Cauchy. So what he did is he computed the logarithmic derivative residue on this interval, which count the number of zeros man minus the number of poles, but the poles were only one. And therefore, he observed that this residue grows like t uh, as t is like t log of t, which is also what Bertrand said today, that the zeros, uh, the separation between them goes like 1 over log, in a way. So prime and number of zero are all symmetric. So the prime grows like uh, n log n. The zeros goes like n divided by log n, and, and so on and so forth. The prime is uh, t divided log n. The number of zeros is t log n. So this is why we know that there has, there has to be infinite number of zeros on this function, this trip. And along the years, many theorems have been discovered by great uh, mathematicians, like Hardy, for instance. He was able to show that there are infinitely many zeros on the critical line. However, he was not able to conclude that all were on the critical line. Okay? There are also very interesting theorems which are called zero density theorem which says that if there are zeros away from the critical axis, their density with respect to the total number of zeros is infinitesimal. So you expect if there is violation, Riemann is really teeny, not uh, maybe few zeros, not uh, a bunch, a large bunch of it. Anyway, there are huge uh, theorem about this, nice uh, equivalent formulation of the Riemann hypothesis, and so on and so forth. Now, I want to, so this is the Riemann uh, function. You might say, but where the hell is the randomness? Well, what are you talking about? Where is the randomness? Well, let me show you how you can spell out that there are some randomness in the story. Let me take the inverse of the Riemann. This function, of course, will have pole instead of zeros. At this point, the main difference is while before I have a binomial, and when I expand, I have all the terms. Now you have a product of the prime uh, directly. So when I start doing this product and collect, once again, the term in terms of the Richelieu series, 
there is something stunning coming out. The stunning thing is that the term of this series has the form minus 1 to power kappa, where kappa are the number of different prime which make the number n. So say differently, the expansion in series of the inverse of the Riemann function involve the so-called square-free numbers. These are the numbers whose uh, prime decomposition contain only one prime at most, no more than one. Now, from this point of view, you might consider the prime like a fermion. And therefore, it's like kind of exclusion principle. You cannot put two fermions on the same state, OK? So the only term which enter in the Dirichlet series are the square free numbers, not all the integer numbers. And enter with a parity, which is really the fermion parity of the number itself, namely how many fermions you have in these levels, OK? OK, now square free numbers are this one. And uh, you might ask, what is the density of square free numbers among the integers? Are they teeny? Are they how they are distributed? Well, there is a very easy way of getting this uh, density, which is the following. Assuming that there is no correlation between uh, numbers, prime numbers, sorry, 1 over p definitely is the probability that a random number x is divisible by a prime p, simply because uh, each p numbers, 1 is divisible by p, simply like that. So I'm making probabilistic what is deterministic, OK? At this point, assuming this, uh, 1 minus 1 over p squared is the probability that a number x is not divisible by the prime p more than twice. If I make all the product on the prime, I'm going to get the probability that a number is a square free numbers. This is, as you know, the inverse of the Riemann zeta function. The result is net, is 6 over pi square, 0 0.1679, blah, blah, blah. Now, I got this really with and wave argument of a physicist. I cannot justify that there are no correlations. I cannot tell you which space of probability I'm using. I, I just blindly do it as you would do experiments. But once you got a number, I can check it. The way I got it might be, but once I got the number, I can check it. So the way you have to do it, you generate the numbers, and you start just uh, killing the square free numbers and count them. And how this story goes? Well, this is, uh, sorry. I mean, the most important figure <laughs> is blind. <laughs> anyway, I'm telling you what happened. What happened is that when you start counting, at the very beginning, it's not exact, of course. Of course not. But it's enough that you arrive around 100 that the curve drastically converges to 6 over pi square. OK? Please do it. Uh, you will see how the, the story goes. OK? So this shows the power of this argument. It's not exact, but asymptotically is going to be exact, because you start missing all this correlation. OK, now, once you got this idea, the inverse of the uh, Riemann zeta function, I can write down as uh, the Richelieu series. And then uh, there is a very simple trick to rewrite any uh, series, the Richelieu series, like a Mellin transform, where the density of the Mellin transform is nothing else the sum of the coefficient of your original function. Now, at this point, remember that mu n is, uh, for square free numbers, is telling you the parity of the numbers. Now, the point is, uh, I'm interested in going up in the number, like uh, square free numbers, uh, I don't know, uh, 101, 102, and so on. So I'm using the additive structure of the integers. But mu is determined by the multiplicative structure of the numbers. And the two are not really correlated. What I mean is uh, you can uh, add the one to a number and jump from highly composite number to a prime without any, any, any problem. Or vice versa, jumping from a prime to a very highly 
composite numbers. So the additive and multiplicative structure of the number are highly uncorrelated. So when I start looking at the sequences of this mu, well, it looks really like a Brownian motion. So when I start looking at how the displacement of this function is going, it starts growing exactly like square root of n. It's not a proof. Eh? I'm just giving you a glimpse what will be the final result. I'm just going to tell you in short notes what is about the sense of the story. And so at this point, if the weight of the melin grows like square root of x, of course the melin will diverge one half. It's the first, the first. And this means that if I was able to push my melin up to one half without never being stopped before, by the duality, I know that all the zeros has to be on the line one half. No one can be off the line. Because if there was half the line, I would be stopped before, not a one half. OK? So this is the sense of the argument. And so this means the first and all the singularity on the line one half. Now, when uh, you think, when you to say, uh, see the things in this way, you might think a lot of, well, maybe this is particular, this, I don't know, this is very peculiar, it will not be robust, and so on and so forth. Well, you know that uh, if you want to understand many deep results of mathematics, you have to enlarge the perspective. One example is uh, when uh, Galois was looking uh, at the impossibility of having solution of the quintic equation on the polynomial. Looks odd. Yeah, but once you embed it in group theory, well, the story becomes obvious, not uh, strange, obvious. So I want to use the same strategy. I want to use the strategy to show you that this result, which looks odd, odd in the sense strange, peculiar, uh, on a single function, as a matter of fact, uh, is embedded in an infinite number of functions that share all the same properties for the same reason I'm telling you, OK? So this is the, the point I want to go. And for that reason, I have to enlarge the perspective and talk about the Richelieu L functions. Now, this is a beautiful subject, which is the following. Richelieu picked up the modular arithmetic by Gauss, which was de developed in Gottingen, and he promoted further. So he said, uh, essentially was doing a condensed matter on a number theory. Take a modulus Q, like 12 on our watch, and then look the numbers which has no common divisor with the modulus. So these are the numbers which are co-prime with the modulus. So in this case, you take all the residue modulus 12, which have no common divisor, in this case, a 1, 5, 7, 11. Why so? Because uh, these numbers make a group under really multiplication. Each time you multiply two residues of that, you get a residue of the same class. This group is a billion. And the number of group and number of elements of this group is the Euler Todian phi, which has uh, an exact expression in terms of the prime decomposition of Q. So for instance, if you take as a modulus 7, the residue class of 7 consists of the residue 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 6, and in general, q minus 1. But if you take a composite modulus like 20, you have to factorize all those like 4 or 2 and so on, which does not have, which has, sorry, common divisor with 20. Now, this is a group, a billion group. Each group has a number of a reducible representation equal to the classes, to the number of classes. But a billion group has number of classes as many as the elements. So there's going to be phi, q, irreducible representation. But being a billion are one dimensional, so are phases. So these irreducible representation are the characters. And therefore, are going to be phases. Phases which depend, of course, on the q I'm using. And uh, as a matter of fact, this character satisfies a series of properties which come uh, mutatis mutandis just from the group uh, structure which is behind. These phases I'm talking about has to be root 
fig root of unity, so for instance. And then is uh, zeros the character as far as the integer does not have common divisor with q, and so on and so forth. It's purely multiplicative and periodic and so on. Now in terms of this quantity, Dirichlet computed, well, introduced these Dirichlet functions made of these characters. So this uh, as the Riemann, this uh, function can be interpreted physically as partition function of three bosons, but with an extra charge, a billion charges. Uh, so I say Q is up to you. You can choose any Q you want, and you have the Dirichlet function. You can choose 100. You have the Dirichlet function associated to the molars Q. So varying Q, you can have infinite many functions at your disposal. Now you see that the Riemann function in this class of functions is a very special case. It's the case where you have chosen modulus to be one. So the simplest and the most obvious one. Okay, so it's really a very peculiar uh, example of this class of function. And here we have really the grand picture of the problem. And the grand picture says that all these function, namely for any modulus Q and any character, have all the zeros on the line one half. So it's not just Riemann. Infinitely many functions share this property. And as a physicist, you start uh, really say has to be a reason because if it is completely independent of the coefficient of this series, I can alter them as much as I want. Should be some basic reason why all these functions shall have the one half uh, as a uh, axis where the zeros are. So now let me go to the main argument. And prime are really peculiar now. I told you this function admit two things, infinite product on prime and series. I can use equivalently, and now I'm using it. So if I take the log of the product here, p say for the product of the function, I develop, and uh, the term which determine really the uh, Axis of convergence is the first term in this expansion. So it's going to be this one. This I write as a melin, and the melin is the sum of the cosine of these phases. But look, the phases are computed along the sequence of the prime. Okay, and this is going to play a crucial role in the story. So the argument goes that if I'm able to show that this weight goes as a power, in particular the power is well half, once again, then all the zeros should be on the critical line for property of the melin. So let's, let me see why this has to be so. I told you that uh, Dirichlet was doing a modular function. So one, two, let's say seven, one, two, three, four, five, seven, and start again, one, two, three, four, so if I start looking the residue on the integer, the story is completely trivial and boring. One, two, three, four, six, zero. One, two, three, four, six, zero, and so on and so forth. However, if I superimpose to it the sequence of prime, and I'm asking what is the residue on the nth prime, the story changed drastically. So. At the beginning, of course, uh, it coincides with the prime themselves. I mean, you cannot do much because the prime are very dense at the very beginning. But when you start collecting all the res residue computed on the prime, let me show you a larger sequences. You start to see that it's a random sequence of the residue, completely random. Okay? And actually, there are theorem. The Richelieu was the first to prove that the, there is a complete equidistribution of the residue among the sequence of prime. It's a theorem, okay? What the Richelieu didn't know was the correlation. So if I know that the residue is one at the 100 prime, what is the probability the next residue is gonna be one or two or whatever? So at this point, I start looking in much more detail this uh, series with the eyes to spot correlation, if any, or to determine what are these properties. So first of all, let me just uh, show you what is the generic term of this series computed on the prime. You see, it's completely chaotic signal. 
you cannot easily predict, it's deterministic, of course. I mean, if you have all the information, I can tell you precisely what's going on. But if you have a coarse graining approach to the problem, I'm sorry, you start losing all this information. Indeed, if you do blindly distribution on this uh, angle, you find really the distribution of random angle. Simple like that. So if I plot this function, among other which I generated by random generator system, you are unable to spot which one is which. Completely impossible to spot it. So what is the property of this series? First of all, all the terms are order one, namely are the same order. I um, uh, say that because when you have a series of random signal, if you have a kind of Levy flight, one term can might dominate the other, and you might have a violation of the limit, central limit theorem. Here, all the term is order one, means that if you want to go far, you have coherently to add all these terms. Otherwise, you don't go far. Moreover, all the angles are equiprobable. I told you, it's the Dirichlet theorem. Indeed, if you do simple analysis, you will find that the Richelieu theorem is satisfied even for short interval. It's asymptotic theorem, of course, but it's satisfied very well for any finite sample. So essentially, I'm playing with a dice of Q phases. Okay? It's what it is. Because all these residues can appear equidistributed equally. The point is, uh, so as a consequence, I know that this series has a vanishing, but uh, I can spot how correlated are these numbers, because this is what matter for. So actually, it's very, very interesting, because it's like Pott's model correlation. Namely, if two residues are equal, are mat is unlikely with respect if they are different. So are like uh, uh, all equal or all different. And the formula is known, is exact. So this is the formula to have uh, a correlation of residue of equal type. You see there is a minus, so they are anti-correlated. Why they are different, they are plus. However, these are finer sides scaling. Means that if you start doing analysis on a spot of prime, for instance, I did up to 10 to the 20. So when I do this, I can spot this teeny fine effect. If I enlarge, I observe decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. So asymptotically, there are no correlation whatsoever between the residue. So the, the residue are uncorrelated. At this point, this deterministic uh, uh, series appear like a random time series, because the average is zero. The Richelieu theorem, the variance is uh, uncorrelated this uh, quadratically, and all the others are like this. And moreover, you know that uh, if you have a really uh, random motion, the limb soup or the distribution contain log log. And this is the famous epsilon I was mentioning at the very beginning. Now, there is a problem in this. The problem is uh, you can say, yeah, but this was a deterministic function. How the hell you are treating as a random? Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a big problem, and for that reason, I want to share with you a work that keep me busy three years just to come here and present you this result, in which I was doing immense, huge, millions of simulation to disprove the fact that this function goes like square root of n. How you do it? Well, there are, uh, there are really tools of doing it. First of all, you have to be uh, you have to understand how to deal with a deterministic series which looks random. And the way of doing is very, very simple. It's like if you take the spot of the time, or the weather, you cannot do much. It's deterministic. But if you look it in detail, appear like random. Okay? So what you have to do is, uh, so is uh, like uh, Jean Perrin determined the random uh, uh, walk, the Brownian motion, of the atom just spotting many, many of the, uh, of the trajectory, but even uh, Nordlund make exactly the same uh, determination of uh, Avogadro number using one sample, which is what I have. I have only one sample. I cannot change it. It's what it is, okay? So what you do, 
This is a very well-known uh, problem, uh, which is called single Brownian trajectory problem. So you take uh, your uh, series and you chop it in all way you like it. Of course, with interval which are big with respect to the sides. So typically, I take 10 to the 12 as a size of this interval, and I sample this function in many, many, many different ways. And the result is, uh, has to be, so I define what is called block variable, and the result has to be, if the original function goes like this, any other subset should go like square root of L, okay? And uh, at this point, there are really many, many tests. I did around 30 tests of, di tests of different size of uh, increasing complexity that help you to determine if a sequence of number is random or not. So imagine you receive a signal from the space. You don't know if there is a being trying to talk to you or is completely random. You can apply systematically more and more and more tests which shrink the prob probability about the nature of this thing. So I use, for instance, discrete Fourier transform, which predict how many has to be like this, and so on and so forth, entropy test, many, many, many of them. Let me just uh, show you one of them. I take uh, uh, a point of these sequences where it was zero, and then I run for uh, t, and I term it t min and t max. Now, if uh, these uh, sequences come from a random motion. There is a theory which predicts the distribution, t min and t max, and the separation. So t min, uh, actually, the distribution of the distance turns out to be this function, which has been computed recently, actually, here in Paris. And uh, when you apply uh, probably statistical test for the goodness of the fit, you see that uh, come out astonished value in particular, the kolmogorov smirnov test, which tells you really how likely is your data with this, 99.9999, okay? And this was for all the tests I apply on the entire sequence and repeated many, many times. So when I plot directly the Mertens function itself, it turns out to be a beautiful Gaussian. And with p-values of this text, which are really remarkable. So there is no doubt that this function satisfies central limit theorem. So with all this, as I said, if the weight of this function, you have a reason to argue that indeed is a random walk, the interval has to be singular at one half, I have no choice. All the zeros has to be there. There is no way out. No one can be out. And so, conclusions, there are infinitely many functions, which as the Riemann has all the zeros and along the line one half. This property can be traced back to some random property of the primes, because you are using them in picking up some residue along these sequences. Since the prime has no modulation, in a way, uh, this is what introduces randomness in the stories. And the validity of the generalized Riemann hypothesis, therefore, seems to rely on probability theorem, nothing else, involving residue and the absence of correlations. And therefore, the generalized Riemann hypothesis can be considered really like random walk theorem, nothing else. Thank you, and happy birthday. So thank you very much, Giuseppe, for the beautiful talk. Uh, so we have maybe time for one quick question. Vincent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but the sense is the same. There is duality. The point is that the Richelet, the characters are generally complex. So the duality related the 1L function with character key to L function with character key bar. For the real, is like the, the Riemann hypothesis. But for the complex, you have to take care of these things. But always, there is this kind of duality. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah.
how much correlation could the prime numbers have uh, in order to stay uh, to, to have the zeros on on this particular line i mean can you use this i mean as a test for mm, uh, i didn't use directly although uh although i I mean, I think it's an interesting uh, aspect to, to deal with, but I didn't use it. As a matter of fact, I didn't use it. Uh, actually, uh, well, I, I don't know even how to quantify correlation in prime. What, what you mean? I mean, probably we have to discuss later. I mean, obviously, prime, as you know, is this kind of mixed nature of being kind of... Uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So on one side, you know rigorously some result. Be like between an integer and its double, there is always a prime. This is low. But where it is, is another story. Okay? As well as the gap. That it can be shorter or can be larger as much as you like. Now, depend what you mean a correlation. But strictly speaking, I didn't use it. I, I use more the correlation on the residue computed on the prime. All right, so we are running a bit late, so let's thank Giuseppe again. Okay.